This is a film of symbiology. Every character in the film represents a symbol and is a symbol of something that happens in each of us. In this particular scene, the beautiful princess who just walked away represents the awareness of the individual. The priest represents each of us, a person who determines how Holy Spirit will act. The one person that looked rather ancient there represents a teaching, not a teacher, but a teaching. And the person who was smoking the cigar and looked like old Lucifer himself represents the conditioning or the purpose of living the four dual basic urges of every individual. This represents that man is left to himself. He has a teaching, but the teaching departs and disappears for the time being, goes over the horizon, and man is left alone. He kisses them, wishes them well, and departs away. The priest is left with the princess, the princess being the awareness, the man, the priest, being each of us, a person who is to find his way in the world without the teaching because it disappears. He has the fragments of it, but he doesn't understand it. It is gone, waves him goodbye. And the princess gradually drifts into a tent, a tent of illusion, surrounded by curtains of disappearance. All comes from the source of the four dual basic urges, the devil. And the, prince, the priest is standing, waiting to see how this whole thing goes about. He represents each of us as a man. And always comes the four dual basic urges that tells us the purpose of living is to gain pleasure and escape pain, to gain attention, to escape being ignored or rejected, to gain approval and escape disapproval, and to be important and escape the inferiority. And of course, this allows the true awareness, that which sees what is from moment to moment, to fall asleep, always while Lucifer, the four dual basic urges, awaits his chance. And the man, each of us, stands and wonders. And the four dual basic urges holds the whole world in his hand because everybody believes that the whole purpose of living is to gain pleasure and escape pain. So he dances on, able to control the whole world and keep them carried on by his fascination. And he walks up to the man. Let's see what he does. He blows smoke in his face and says, I'll insult you because I'm in charge. And he picks up the awareness of man and walks away with it, with man never really seeming to know what happened to him, that now he is left totally controlled by conditioning. He has become mechanical and controlled by the conditioning factors of man while the four dual basic urges walks away with the true awareness and it's sound asleep. He takes it away to his castle, the castle of the Four dual basic urges represent security, that which everyone seeks for, hoping to be secure and not be disturbed in any way. But always he is reminded by the cemetery that death awaits him. And how secure can anyone be when death is his constant companion and that he knows that is his end. Try as he might, he always knows it's there. So here walks each of us in the form of the priest looking it over. And he is beginning to wonder what is the purpose of living? What's it all about? This seems to be the end of all. He has, of course, been taught that he should be good and do good. And that he should teach all others to do good and be good. But regardless of whether they're good or what he calls bad, whether they fit any given set of conditioning or not, the end is still the same, the grave. So he's wondering, wondering, what's it all about? He looks down and sees each of these. Many he has known, some he has not. They have been living beings, 
and now all that remains is a little stone with a name and a date on it. And he looks at the cross and wonders what it means. He has put great faith in the cross and wonders what it means. Does it mean life? Does it mean death? What does it represent? It is the, one of the most powerful symbols of the Judeo-Christian religion and all that each of us stands for. But what does it really mean? What does it represent? So we we'll sit down and ponder this question. Gain the pose of the thinker and think it over as though thinking could find it out. But thinking is all conditioned. One side of thinking says, complain and stick up for rights and blame. And another side of thinking says, please everybody and believe and do as you're told by your authorities and be different, put on a different front, behave altogether differently, be good in other words. And the other one says, why be good? Do what you want to. Life is short and it leads nowhere except to the grave. So one wonders and wonders, what's it all about? Where does it come from? Where does it go? What is this thing called life? What is the purpose of the living from day to day? Is it to be good? Is it to achieve? Is it to be successful? Is it to have all the fun one can have? Is it to have all the pleasure one can? But sooner or later, each of us is as the priest. We have to wonder, what is the purpose of living? So we shall go on a quest. Possibly the best way is to get in an automobile and drive away and try to find the meaning of life. What does it all mean? Where does it lead? So now we're on the way to see if we can find out what is the purpose of living. We're on a way on a road. But where does that road end? Is it to stop here? Is it to proceed on? Is it to turn to the right or to the left? Where lies the answer? So man goes on a quest to find the answer to what is the purpose of living. So maybe he goes uphill, maybe he comes to stop signs, cross signs, turns on the road. But whichever way he goes, he's trying to find what is the purpose of all this being? What is the purpose of living? So let's see where it leads to. As we wander across various and sundry ways, we see life in all ways. We see it in trees, we see it in grass, we see it in human beings, we see it in the man. But the man is in a quandary. What's it all about? Surely to goodness it has more meaning than to be born, live a few years, study a few things, struggle, be in conflict, try to be good, and wind up in the cemetery. So he goes to one of the places that he hopes to find the answer, called the church. Of course, the church is supposed to be the home of Almighty Spirit. So he goes to try and see what we'll do. Let's see what happens. As we observe the lovely little church, the cross on top and all the symbols that all mean so much and so few knew what they mean. So we will pray before a lighted candle, the candles representing the eternal vigilance that is man's lot to live through. And so we look. And we wonder. And we again return. We stand before the symbol of the greatest teacher. We see the symbol of the crucifixion. We see the symbol of confession. We see the symbols of surrender, but they really mean nothing because they are only symbols. And while a symbol is a great book, it is not the thing itself. 
So we can go to confession. We can s confess to ourselves. We can feel that we have surrendered. But still, it's only conditioning to it. The person hasn't really discovered. One can feel emotional over great scenes, a passion of the great teacher. But still, it is only emotions. So the answer wasn't given here. So we walk out to see what we can find somewhere else. We did not receive the answer the man wanted here. So he boldly walks out, opens the door and goes out into the world of the living, the world of trees and plants, sunshine and cloud and rain. And what will he find? So he walks on his way as each of us walks through the way trying to find what's it really all about. Can walk into the sunset and walk down the various ways and walk through the fields of all the flowers. They don't seem to have any problems in wondering what it's all about. They're blooming and waving in the breeze. They're accepting whatever Forces come to them today. There is resistance to their growth from the very harsh climate of the desert. But they just go on with their growing. Seemingly no complaints. Seemingly no wondering what it's about. But the man seems to ignore the lesson they teach because they are teaching too. That my job is to be about what I am. The flower is about being a flower the trees about being trees, but the man feels he must be about some greater purpose. And possibly this is very true because man has a complex destiny, a complex occupation. He is the highest developed of all creatures. Consequently, he has the greatest liabilities to him also. He is liable to being conditioned. He is liable to being controlled by the powers of the ability to learn. So he learns something in a way and it becomes a ruler and he rules that thing, rules that man from then on, whether he is aware of it or not. So he has two sets of training here. He has been trained that he should complain, stick up for his rights and blame. He has also been trained that he should please everyone he comes in contact, that he should believe and do as he's been told by his authorities and that he should be different. So he stops by the reflowing water, which says that everything flows on, that no circumstance remains the same. While he stands on the bank of the great Rio Grande River, that river is not the same except in name because the water is different every few minutes. And the birds fly about. The little swallows, they gather up mud and build their nest on flat surfaces and make little adobe homes, which possibly taught the original inhabitants of this great area how to build themselves shelters out of mud, which most of the buildings are. But still he doesn't see that the birds are teaching. Somebody long ago caught on how to build a house and that's the last thing they learned possibly. So he walks away down the banks of the mighty Rio Grande. We kind of lose him in the shadows and he shows up against the mighty mountains. And the mountains have been there for eternity. They brood away, never trying to change seemingly. However, there is constant minute change. They're worn away by the wind and the weather, but they make no moans about it. The cactus stands in this land as though it were a very fertile place. It is home to the cactus, where three inches of rain a year is normal. But the man looks on, and he trudges away to the mountain because he's heard some words that the higher one goes, the nearer one is to Holy Spirit. So he trudges up the mountain as though mere height of altitude was the way, really. Let's see what he finds as he trudges on. In all probability, only the going gets rougher. 
The little plants are all serene where they are, but the man is down on his knees, struggling, climbing. As most of us, through our everyday existence, struggles to try to gain a higher state of existence, we seem to know that it exists if we could only find it. And so we call this seeking, which maybe we could say is only struggle. And struggle only leads to more struggle. <coughs> and possibly the higher thing he's looking for, he's carrying with him and doesn't know where to look. But he feels that he must struggle on through a various severe odds, climb and struggle through the rocks and the thorns and the brambles, all of which are at home here. But the man is out of his natural habitat. But he struggles on fatigued and weary, but he's climbing ever higher. So he feels he must be accomplishing something because they told him it was higher. So he's going on, believing and doing as his authorities have told him. And as he looks at the mighty mountains, he feels rather insignificant. And he finds that it, he is insignificant in strength and the struggle to conquer this mountain that he is climbing. He has to go on all fours like an animal. And he is in a very strange, somewhat frightening terrain, like the person who's trying to find what to do and how to do. So he picks up many techniques, and if he will only say certain rituals, if he will only fast ever so often, if he will only believe certain things, he will someday arrive. So, of course, he arrives somewhere, but where is it? In the rocks and the crevices in the mountains with the beating of the wind. And dark shadows shows all around him. But it must be here somewhere, because I'm ever climbing higher. So he goes into the dark crevices to see what it's like and it only opens into another crevice. And he still climbs. There must be a way, somewhere, for man to find what life is all about. So if he only works hard enough and struggles hard enough and climbs insurmountable barriers, no doubt he will find it. Let's see how each of us goes about it. Oh, he's getting higher now, and he's beginning to gain. He finds an opening. He struggles and climbs. The goal seems to be in sight. You know, man always seems to where you were struggling towards a goal, a goal meaning some ideal. If he can only reach some exalted height, he knows everything will be fine. But some way, the ideals never seem to materialize because his ideal is always a place where there is no interference, where he is living with nothing but pleasure and comfort, where he constantly receives attention and adulation, where he constantly receives approval, and where he's the most important of all. And here the man went as far as he can and is still not there. So he looks to the heavens and holds out his hands because he always feels his God is off in the sky somewhere. He has never occurred that it may be right here with him because maybe life is that Holy Spirit. But of course, he is conditioned. He is asleep. He's mechanical. So now he's looking. But at least he is struggling and trying. He is really wanting. He really wants to know. He is asking, one might say, he is knocking, he is seeking, and while his way is peculiar. Somewhere in the distance is the teaching. It says that whoever is knocks shall receive, and who who seeks shall find, and who asks shall receive. And he is asking. He truly wants to know because he has asked in the only way that's really possible to ask. I don't know. And so he's looking, and somewhere out there, the teaching will meet with them. Not a teacher, but a teaching. It's a very ancient teaching. So the teaching will be represented by a man of antiquity, one who you would never meet in this modern day world. But still the teaching is modern as tomorrow, is new as today. 
And as old as those mountains, the man has struggled to climb. He sees that there is something in way, and he begins to feel a light. And now he's like he's floating. Almost he's weightless and moving on, because now he begins to see a way. Because somewhere he came in sight, at least, of the teaching. And this, of course, represents a dream that every man has. He's out in a peculiar wasteland, <clears throat> a very unfamiliar type of terrain. But he's like floating on. So let's see what happens as he floats across this unusual terrain where only space is present. It looks the same in every direction. There is really nothing that says this is the way to go. So he just goes now, but he looks free and easy. Somewhere he caught sight of something. Even though that sight that one catches flits about and seems to be gone for a moment and back a moment when one even knows that it exists, gives one a sense of lightness, a sense of serenity, a sense of accomplishment where one can go, a direction. So let's see what he does when he stands without a need to struggle in any direction now. The struggle of the mountain climbing seems to be unnecessary. He can stand and look over this vast expanse that represents the world in which we all live, which has every conceivable sort of thing. But at some moment may seem like a desert. Another may seem a mountain. Another, it may seem something else. Very strange and unusual lights flit about. So let's see what happens as the man just stands instead of struggles so hard now. He looks about and can move in any direction. And again, he catches sight of the teaching. Now he sits down to receive a teaching. And the teacher, teaching in the form of a very ancient man, gives him a piece of bread, and he takes the bread himself. He picks up a chalice, a container, and pours glasses full of wine. Now the bread represents that which is of value, and the wine represents that which is true. So in order to see anything, it is necessary to see that which is true and then to see the value of that truth or one never uses it, one only talks about it. And he points out his beautiful symbol on the ground, a most unusual one. It is a V with some various lines on it and some very peculiar creatures called gargoyles. Now, the, te well, the first one he showed him is called the four dual basic urges, that one is the complainer. Now he's picked up the sticker up for rights. It says, I have rights. And now he, on another side, he picks up one that you were taught that says, you gotta please everybody. Now he picks up the one that says, believe and do as you're told by your authority. And now he picks up the one that says, you must put on a good front and be different, a scribe or a Pharisee. And now he picks up the blamer and says, look here, now if we just everybody else would be different, I'd be all right. And this is the one that picks up and says, I'm very important. And here is one that represents a big X. It represents the life principle, that which is really true within man, that which is eternal. And he shows him a book, a book in the form of a bowl or a glass ball that shows the beginnings and the ends of all things, that life is really all there is, and that it is full of an ever-moving, ever-changing thing. But quickly, the man falls to sleep. He says, I see, I understand, and that puts him to sleep. And of course, here appears the great deceiver. And he puts a little ribbon on him and takes off. Now, let's see what he's going to do. A man lies asleep, asleep in awareness. He is said, I understand, I know, long before he did. And consequently, that puts him sound asleep. He's totally controlled. And so he flits and bounces a little uncomfortable in his strange dreams. He rolls about. 
He moves from side to side, and first one time he's trying to get his way but complaining, sticking up for his rights and blaming, and another moment he rolls over another way, and he's all that thinks he's different and improved himself because now he's pleasing people. And doing as he's told by his authorities, and he's putting on a different front. But he finds something peculiar. He has a little ribbon on him. It's something attracted him. And of course, being a human, he's very curious as to where this all leads. So he starts out to follow it because it's bound to be something very beautiful and useful or it wouldn't be here. It's almost as an omen happened and now he's going to find something. So he takes off to follow it. And he follow, he has a line to follow. You might say a wave, but it's an ever shifting ribbon. It's not always exactly the same, and it's very immaterial. It's just a little ribbon leaves a line across the endless spaces of the sand. So he trudges on. Wonder how long it is. It seems to be long. So he keeps coming and looking. He's finding to follow the path. Now he knows he will find it. The breeze shifts it about. But nevertheless, it's somewhere is in the same general direction. So he knows he's going to find it. It's like so many roads, where does it lead? So he's coming on and the ribbon still stretches on across the endless spaces. Men look for years and years and years. They are given a bit of teaching and immediately go to sleep and start following another pail because it looks interesting it looks mysterious, it looks mystifying, so it must be something very worthwhile. It must be at least some point of truth, but let's see who's down there waiting. He's jumping with glee because he's caught the man back. The teaching will now, he will overcome because you see there's really a very basic warfare going on between the four dual basic urges represented by the man with the beard, the black hat and the cape and the teaching that showed him the picture of man. So now the man falls down in his way, but look who's coming. Nothing but pride and vanity itself, decked in her beautiful clothing. And she goes and sits in a throne, surrounded by jewels. And she is pride and vanity. It says, I know before I know. It says, I understand before I understand. It says, I've achieved long before there's anything to achieve. I've only been acquainted with the teaching, and now I think I know everything. <clears throat> I haven't lived it. I can only say the words, but I say, yes, I know all about that. So now I'm looking for greater things. Basics no longer interest me. I'm looking for higher things. And so the man again is fascinated by the beauty of pride and vanity. Vanity is having a false picture of oneself and pride is defending it. I have really achieved and what a glorious thing it seems to be to have because I can pat the conditioned self on the back and say, I have arrived. Look what wonders comes to me. And our old friend is so pleased with himself because he sent pride and vanity, possibly his greatest co-worker of all time. And she says, how wonderful you are. You are the greatest thing that ever lived because you understand. And the teaching only stands silently and watches while he delves in the riches of the world. It says, gain this and you will have all. Then you will be secure. He tries it and falls down to kiss the feet, the pride and vanity, which we all do because it feels so nice to believe that we really know and understand long before we do. We read a book, we listen to a talk, and the old friend dances with glee, doesn't he? Because he has now pulled the person away from the enemy, the teacher, the teaching that shows what the true purpose of living is, the truth to understand, and shows that the way of through to truth is to understand illusion for what it is, and now the four dual basic urges, the prince of this world, has caught him totally back into his clutches. And the man believes that the whole purpose of living is to gain pleasure 
and escape pain. And the way to gain pleasure and pain on all directions and have attention and approval and be important is to be able to control the wealth of the world and that he is in charge of it and he is controlled. Really does he realize that he is the one being controlled because he feels he knows. Now he has a faint remembrance. Somewhere he remembered about the teaching and so he better run from knowing. But also, should he go, maybe it's only an illusion and this for sure is real. This illusion is real, it's right here, you can see it. And so interesting, so pride and vanity scores another lick. But how does one be feel? One's tied up and controlled by pride and vanity, pulled in like a fish. One is totally in bondage. One is bound. The teaching looks on but does nothing while pride and vanity steps on you and throws everything in your face and says, so what, big boy, goodbye. You don't amount to nothing. So one loses one's vanity, but still has a decided false picture of self as being in bondage now, and wishes that one could have back the old feeling when one was so certain one knew, but now one is in bondage, one is control, one is in conflict. One wants to go this way, but one can't. One remembers something and tries to go another way and can't, so only with great effort and with tremendous agony, one can get on one's way again, but still one's brush with pride and vanity has left one in a state of bondage, and so one trudges across the sand, dragging a rope to knock out the line. So let's see where one gets to while one is in this state of bondage. It is called conflict. So with the struggle of conflict, one falls frequently, twists about and with great effort continues on one's way. Greatly hampered, everything is a conflict. I want to do this, but I don't want to do it. And so on goes the struggle of very great difficulty to get through the ordinary parts of everyday life. Finally, one feels that one is tossed about by every circumstance that comes along. One no longer is in charge of one's own state, but is the victim of circumstances. Circumstances determines whether one stands or falls. And so one then begins to feel that one is a victim of circumstances, and that circumstances determines one's inner state. But after sufficient falls, one wakens a wee bit and says, now wait a minute, maybe I could do something about this that really I'm not in bondage, it only seemed to be. And one begins to see that there is always a clown about. A clown is the not eyes, the four dual basic urges, and the urge to complain and stick up for one's rights. The urge to blame, the urge to believe and do as one is told by one's authorities, the urge to please everyone and feel hurt if they're not pleased. So it continually pounds in one's ears and makes the constant sounds that is commonly called thought. And it goes on and on. And this is something for man to be thankful of. It really isn't tormenting us unless we believe that is I. And of course our hero here seems to feel that that is I. But that is not I. And it dances about like the gesture in the kingdom courts of old. Every well-run king's court had a court jester because the jester was there to remind them that that was the way man behaves when he isn't conscious, when he's under the control of conditioning. So as long as one doesn't identify with all this conditioning, it's kind of fun to have the clown around to keep us reminded that I am in charge. I am responsible that circumstances do not determine my inner state, that I don't know and I can only see from moment to moment. And consequently, there is something within me that always does the appropriate thing when I see clearly moment by moment. But forever and ever, the clown dances on. 
reminding us that if we go to sleep and do not take charge, that the clown will take over the kingdom, much like Rasputin, who was the clown for the king of Russia, the czar of Russia, and he took over and destroyed the kingdom. So when the man begins to realize that this clown is always around, he again seeks the teaching, and the teaching begins to show him that he can see self, which is really the enemy, the not eyes. It is self with a little s, and that the real self can begin to take over. So he looks and he begins to see that all life is explained and described in what has gone on. So now he sees that he has been a judge and that the person he judged was self, that he found fault with self. He did not like self. And so he passed out judgment on self. And again, as he gazes in, he sees the judge looking through every authority he has ever looked. You know, books become our authorities. So we read the book, and it says this is wrong, and this ought to be. And using this, the clown, really, in the form of the judge, begins to find fault with the self. And every now and then he finds one that really relates to him. And so an ever stronger sentence is passed out and judgment is put on. And this is known as guilt. Who's doing the judging? Only the conditioning. The conditioning judges. And so the man looks and wonders, yes, I've judged self. And by what grounds did I do it? Only conditioning. Because I identified with that bit of conditioning It said, you must please everybody, and you must believe and do as you've been told by your authorities, and you must put on a different front and be different all the time. So he condemns the self. He condemns and passes out of his severe, severe judgment, hours and hours and days and weeks and months of feeling guilty. He sheds the tears and wonders. The judge is ever glaring down. He was in those gargoyles that said, please everybody, believe and do as you're told by your authorities and be different. And he has given the nod to the one that stuck up for right sometime and the one that complained and the one that blamed and the judge is holding out you are forever condemned. What does one do? How long does one feel guilty in order to get over feeling guilt? He has a false idea of repentance, and now he looks again. And let's see what he sees now. He looks at self. Self is a mirror. So he sees what man does, that the real self, the awareness, that which is real in man, is condemned. Condemned to carry a heavy cross and struggle up. What is he condemned with? The teachings of the world, that there should be's and ought to's and you must, all from what some authority said. And who was the authority? Someone who wanted to control, direct. And so the real being, the awareness function of Holy Spirit, has to struggle on under a tremendous load of torment through a blazing sun while the conditioning in man that says, believe and do as you're told by authorities and please everybody and be different, has passed out the sentence and condemned thy real awareness to torment. And so man crucifies all that's real, all that conditioning when identified with crucifies the real being. The world, of course, comes in several different lines. 
we have four major authorities. This is the first one. It's theology. And he says this is a must. And this is a must. And you have to. And if you don't, you're horribly guilty. And so the real self, I, is pounded under, crushed by all the should-be's and the ought-to-be's that various and sundry from their various conditionings have laid out for man to live by. And he has nailed to the cross. But that's not the only authority we have. Here comes the healing arts. And the healing arts sets out a standard for you to says normal. And nobody fits it because we are living beings that change moment to moment, adapting not only to the misconceptions that we have within, but to the environment and to the nutrition that we may and may not have due to what is sold to us by various and sundry that says this you must have. This you are not well unless you use and by the activity that says that the best living is to be totally at rest and at ease and never do anything that's any effort. And this drives in more nails and further adds to the crucifixion. And of course, here comes the mighty power of politics that says this you must do. You are subject to power by virtue of office. And you must do this and you must do that. You must kill on command. You must tell on your brother at command. You must give your substance to aid and abet killing and wars. And that you must mete out justice because everybody knows what's right, proper, and justifiable and they go on and do wrong anyway. And this, of course, crucifies the being. And then last of all comes big business with its accounts payable, which we have built against everybody that comes along that didn't treat us just like we wanted. The conditioning says, you have mistreated me, and so that I must get revenge. And so all sorts of these are added on, and that finally drops the post and the ground. And the real being, the real man, is hung to die in the sun while the conditioning has won another round. The prince of this world has crucified the real being. Conditioning has won another. And so each of us stands and looks. And we look. And we see the seamless robe, which is the truth, dropped upon the ground. While we, of course, justify because all these things that the real being, real living wanted to do was of necessity evil in some way or other because it was not what one should do and ought to do and what one was entitled to have. And so finally, the real man is crushed, crucified, and dies within. And the conditioning, the four dual basic urges and its henchmen has won another round. And let's see how man looks upon this. So he sees that he too has crucified the real being, that he has cast it apart and that he is living conditioning and he looks at self again and this time he is given some truth represented by the wine truth which is to understand illusion truth is not something all different from self but when one sees an illusion for what it is one has then seen the truth and he sees the truth and he sees the picture of man in the background what's within so he walks with the teaching for a while. And this time, for certain, he intends to use it forevermore. He walks away 
and tries to take the teaching with him within himself. He sees the truth. He sees illusions for what they are. So he's going to rescue awareness from the stronghold of the mighty four dual basic urges who lives in his castle called security and says, you can't touch me and I'm glad to see you come. But he goes boldly in. He is going to retrieve that which is his natural right, full awareness. And he finds awareness and of course, the four dual basic urges says, here's the whole world. If you would but fall down and worship me, I'll give it to you all. I have charge of it. And maybe he really does, who knows. And of course, the princess that really wants to be the one companion and one with the man. Retrieve her natural birthright. But the four dual basic urges is a very persuasive salesman. He says, after all, what use is anything if you aren't comfortable? What value it to it if you have pain? What value is it if you're not approved of and have a claim and that you have respect of the world? Okay, if you don't want it, I'll keep it. All of a sudden, when one tries to fight the four dual basic urges and make it disappear, it disappears and backs up somewhere else and holds out more goodies and offers one the world and the whole earth to rule. Because after all, what really is important? But again, he disappears. You cannot fight it. You can only see that he really has no value. That he is only a piece of conditioning and consequently isn't real that if one doesn't identify with him. So the four door basic urges says, all right, you have won, but never believe it. So now he's cut down to size in the eyes of the beholder. He's a tiny little doll. He really has disidentified from him at this point and says he's simply something and has no power over me. I see that that is a false purpose of living and so he's a cute little doll, just put him in my pocket and take him along. Maybe I can use him sometime. Somewhere it is written, get behind me. So maybe it's just as well to put him in his pocket. But now the awareness seems to disappear. Of course, maybe she disappeared too within the man where awareness rightfully belongs instead of a goal to seek or to try to retrieve. But the awareness goes to the teaching and says the teaching is the only truth is the only thing that is worthwhile to us. And so the awareness who is with, interested in the teaching now and gets very involved with the teaching. The teaching, the real man, combined together has left the cross and is in the land of flowers and trees and light. But the man seeks on, where is it? So he's heard the story of the Holy Grail, and if he can but find it, that he will have all. So he's now seeking for the Holy Grail, which is the cup that holds the blood of the truth. So he goes seeking still, even though it is within. Awareness is very much in love with the teaching. The man still believes in his own powers to seek and find. Let's see how he does. Looking in the trees, he always looks up, hoping that it will be up there somewhere. So he hopes to find the Holy Grail high in the mountains or high in a tree or up in the sky. So he looks out over the beauty of the great expanse of being. And he walks down the bubbling stream everywhere's looking up beyond onward somewhere else couldn't be here but he's going to find it no matter what so he is sincere he is looking he is asking he's knocking and even though he's still struggling a bit with illusion he still even though he has lowered the size of the four dual basic urges to put it in his pocket he still somewhat believes that this is the purpose of living. 
and that if he can only find the truth, he will have it. So he wants to find the truth. And though it's all about him, he has to look for it. It's like a man looking for the sun at noonday. So he walks and he looks. And it must be on beyond somewhere. Somewhere out there it is. And so he's on a pilgrimage to find it. The teaching he recognized, but only to the degree that it was somewhere else. And he thought that what was taught was symbols and not something about himself. He looks into the beauty, but he doesn't see the beauty because he's not looking for the beauty. He's looking for the Holy Grail, the truth all in a nice little cup. Ah, there sits the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail represents the teaching and action that one has applied it so that when one drinks of the Holy Grail, one has eternal life. He has applied the teaching to himself. He now sees the conditioning for what it is and has disidentified from it, and he will be alive. Let's see if the man gets to drink from the Holy Grail. Drink deeply of the truth. It's always there, but can he see it? Or is he lost in the trees? Is he looking up and it's sitting over somewhere else near the ground? Keep on looking up. Oh, there sits the Holy Grail, sitting on the lowly ground, not up in the heights, not in the sky, not in the trees, merely sitting on the ground, on good Mother Earth, with all the rest in its brimming, with the wine, the truth. Oh, he finds, and oh, he wishes to have eternal life, so he shall drink it. What great moment to begin to act upon the truth in all the union, the teaching, awareness, and man. And they all shall drink. And now the union takes place. What does one see when now has seen the truth? One sees illusions for what they are. One sees that all conditioning is an illusion. So now he drinks and he sees. He sets the cup down. But he has acted upon it. And he is thankful within because he's acted on it. And the cup refills evermore. It is never empty. The cup of truth is always full and it runs over and ever fills. The truth is abundant because illusions are abundant. And when one sees an illusion for what it is, one has seen the truth. And that truth flows out. And it pours down upon all the rocky places. It becomes a stream. And that stream becomes crystal clear water that nourishes all, nourishes life. Because one is seeing these ever-ending illusions for what they are. One is seeing truth. And that truth turns into a mighty bubbling brook, a flowing of crystal clear water that supports all matter of life. And all this life is interrelated where each supplies the other on this life. Everything floats on the beautiful bubbling water. An abundance of truth. There to nourish man, that he may have life and have it more abundantly. 
it is without end. It is peaceful, serene, life-giving, and crystal clear. It moves on through every conceivable type of circumstance, but always the beautiful truth. It nourishes the trees, and the trees nourish animals and man. They provide for everything that man needs. Everything that he requires for his existence is, comes from that flowing water of the truth represented by every kind of tree and plant that is forever bearing everything that man needs. Everything vibrates, everything moves, everything flowers, Everything spreads forth beauty, and everything folds into itself at one time or another. And the light flashes, the trees dimble in the wind, and they're of every kind. Everything bears its fruit to reproduce its kind. Everything flowers. And all the beauty of the many blossoms bears not only the fruit to reproduce its kind, but gives forth nectar. And it promises to bring fruit that man may eat. And the tiny bee in its existence does its part of the work to spread the pollen and all part of one great whole called life. The bee eats, but the bee gives. The bee does a service, it makes a contribution. It is harmless, and it understands that everything has its own place. So the bee flutters away, seemingly only intent upon gathering things. And the crow stands as the mighty symbol that the world crucifies man, that it represents all that destroys man. 